Hello, I wanted to share with you this month's fossil, which is Epitrilopus. And it's a particular fossil that I actually found and been working on as part of my research. And I want to talk a little bit about why this particular fossil has caused me so much frustration. Um, so this was collected in 2016 from the Duchesne River Formation from very low uh, here in Utah. And it consists of uh, five teeth. We have uh, the second molar, the first molar, the fourth premolar, and then we're missing the third premolar, and then we have the, the first premolar and the second premolar. And this fossil I found, and I was working it into a paper that I've been working on on fossil tapers from, uh, from the Eocene. And uh, I sent it a copy of the manuscript to some experts on tapers, got their opinion, and they didn't they sort of said, yeah, that's, that looks like maybe Isectolophus. They agreed with me that it might be a taper. Um, it went through a couple more reviews, and a reviewer just mentioned something that caught me and off guard, and I sort of did a lot more research. And in fact, uh, about a week ago, I went to the museum and took a look at uh, this fossil in particular, and I've revised my identification. It's not a taper. It's actually a rhino a tiny little rhino from the Middle Eocene. And uh, what clued me in was um, a reviewer mentioned how unusual it was that the second molar was more worn than the first molar. Typically in a mammal jaw, the teeth come up at different points in the lifespan of a mammal. And so usually the first molar is the first molar to erupt uh, in tapers. And so that usually gets the most amount of wear and then the second one comes up and then it starts getting wear. This, what's unusual about this fossil is that the, th the second molar is pretty worn, but the first one is not. And this anonymous reviewer suggested that I look at Heracodont rhinos, um, that this might actually be a rhino rather than a taper. So um, I went back to the museum and took a look at their stuff and I realized that they were right. This is a teeny, tiny rhinoceros of a genus Epitrilopus. Um, Epitrilopus is a very rare, fairly rare um, uh, early rhino. Uh, there's a beautiful skull that's the holotype that was discovered about 100 years ago here in Utah um, from about the same, a little bit lower in the stratigraphic uh, uh, zone that I found this little guy in. Um, there's also been some specimens that have been found in Texas and a few reported from Wyoming. Um, but Epitrilopus is a very small rhinoceros, and the skull looks very rhinoceros-esque. If I had the upper teeth, I would have in instantly have known this is a rhinoceros because they have very characteristic teeth. So what fooled me? What made me think that this was a taper? Well, one thing is that both rhinoceroses and taper, uh, tapers have very low-fed teeth that are sort of parallel to, uh, to the jaw, or I mean perpendicular to the jaw, so there are these loafs that go, go across here, and they're very high, and that's very characteristic of both tapers and rhinos. Uh, molecular phylogenies group tapers and um, rhinos into a single group uh, called the serrata morpha. And, um, but what really fooled me, and if I had it, I would have recognized it, was I was missing the third molar, the last tooth in the tooth roll. Uh, in um, Epitrilopus, it's a very short tooth, whereas in um, Isectolophus, the taper, it's a very long tooth. So I was missing that. So that fooled me. <laughs> um, so I didn't have those. The third premolar is also very characteristic of these guys too. And so if I had that tooth, I probably would have been able to, to uh, characterize this. So I'm going to make a cast of this. All right, so I have this... Um, little box I've created with Legos that I've put in here. Um, and I've actually put the jaw in here. What's holding the teeth together in part is clay, which I have, um, it's still soft, which is perfect for making a cast. And that way, when I remove it, I can, uh, from the mold, it'll be easy to do that. And I've tried to basically make it so that the teeth are kind of filled in any sort of little holes or gaps that uh, our mold material might creep into. Although I want to be very careful when removing these from the mold that everything pulls out correctly and doesn't get too stuck with it. 
So I've put it in here. We're going to cover this with a uh, molding compound. And before I do that, I want to make sure that um, to make the cast that I have an open part. So the bottom is going to be the open part. So I'll flip it over and then I can make the cast from the inside with the resin. So I'm going to use a mold release and spray it down really good in there so it doesn't stick to the fossil at all. And this I can wash off later on. The biggest, the biggest danger you have in making these casts is that uh, the mold itself will stick to your teeth. So you want to, your fossil, so you want to make sure you get, it can easily slip off. Okay. So we're going to let that kind of dry there and then we'll make the molding compound. All right, so what I'm using is Umu 30, which is the smooth on uh, uh, mold. It's a silicon rubber mold that I use. I sometimes use the latex too. Tin curd silicon rubber mold that I'll be adding. And it comes two parts that we mix together and then we let it dry. This one I think takes, uh, probably usually I let it dry overnight when I do it. So we're gonna mix up equal amounts and I gotta make sure that when I combine these, this will at least come up to the top. If I have a little bit more, that's good. If I have too little, that's bad because I'll have to remake up some. So, all right, so let's do it. Do, we're gonna get these equal to each other and one is red and one is blue, so we mix them together, they turn purple, which is nice. So let's see. Mix them, so I'm gonna pour that one in there. And then we mix it really good. You can see how the bubbles are all coming out of it, being sucked out in the vacuum. And that'll make it so that air bubbles won't appear when we make our mold. Take that off. Depressurize. Okay, now comes the scary part, and that is we pour this very gently over and very evenly over the fossil. All right, so we now uh, have it all full, and we're going to let it dry. Still little bubbles in there. And uh, get it dry. All right, so now is the scary part. This is has dried. Take this off here. Like so. And take these all off. Alright, so now we got the, the block and now we gotta open this up very carefully and pull out the fossil. So we're just going to carefully pop it open. The cast, uh, we're going to put that in there. And this we can put back together because I didn't have the uh, clay hardened because I wanted it to be able to come apart like that. But we can, we can put those pieces back together. Add a little bit of that. All right, so now I'm going to use um, mix up the resin. And this is easy cast. Um, that I'm going to do. And if I mix this normally, it would be uh, clear. But I want to add some color to it so it's white. It's easier to 
later paint. So I'm going to add some pigment um, into this and uh, grab a mixer. And this requires quite a bit of mixing. And this one I'm not going to put through the um, vacuum because if I did that, it would actually cause bubbles. So in here, just a little So I think it's all dry. So let's take a look. I'm hoping there's no bubbles. Perfect. Actually, that's good. Good cast. Nicely done. And there we have our cast. Thank you for watching, and I want to especially thank the Foreigner Family Foundation, the Utah Fieldhouse Museum in Vernal, Utah, and the Bureau of Land Management. This cool fossil was collected under permit UT 12-0001S, and I want to thank my Patreon supporters. The Allosaurus supporters will be getting a cast in the mail. Now that the weather is finally warming up, I hope to be back in the field with a new episode of the Rocks of Utah on the Late Triassic Nugget Formation in the next few weeks. So be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss another episode.